In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. Today we notice uh, we're reading a very special reading from the Holy Gospel of St. Matthew because the church today celebrates the, the fathers who gathered in the Fourth Ecumenical Council in the year of 451. I'm not going to talk about the theology that came out of that, but it is an emphasis on the two natures of Christ and how they did not intermingle and that he was fully man and fully God at the same time. So in reference to those fathers, we read this gospel to remind us that they are the light of the, wor the, light of the world and we are in their footsteps should be also the light of the world. So that's why this gospel was read today. Sometimes we take this expression of the Lord saying that you are the light of the world or to his disciples, that it's a badge of honor for us as Christians, that we are the light of the world. Look at us how good we are. But we overlook the few sentences that come afterwards in that same paragraph. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So it is about shining the light that we get from Christ so that we're going to do the good works. There's no option of not doing the good works. But the issue is the glory should not come to us but to our Father who is in heaven. So we have to do those and it's not about look at me how good I am, rather look at him how good he is. Look at God who is my God and who transforms my life every day so that I will do the good works and reflect him in every day of my life. So everything I do is a reflection of who my Lord is and this way it's not about me, it's, not, it's about him for the rest of my life, I hope. So the theme of light and reflection continues in so many things that we do in church. And I want to continue what I talked about two weeks ago about the building of the church, but how this whole thing is not just a building. There's something that will take us from this reality to something that's beyond of it. But let me first highlight something about the light. We use olive oil in church so much, not only for the unction, for the baptism, everywhere when we have a, a light on the altar, it's usually using olive oil. The reason is because before the time of electricity, olive oil was the source of light. So in every anointment with the holy oil, we're reflecting on the light of Christ coming on us through that anointment or through that use. We do that in the baptism, but also, as I said, in unction. Also, the theme of light comes with the candles. When we come inside an Orthodox church, the first thing that we should be doing, light a candle, not only to pray for ourselves, for the people that we love, but also it's a reminder of how we should live our life, which is to melt away like the candle so that we can bring light to the world. This is what the candles are there, for us. And that's also because of the nature of the light. It is enough to have one ray of light for the entire darkness to dissipate. You only need one spark of light that's enough to dissipate all darkness. And this is how much, how little the work we need to do, although it's not easy, to bring light to the world. It's only one ray that is enough to reflect Christ once a day probably, and that's enough to dissipate so much of the darkness that is surrounding us. In that reflection that I talked about last two weeks ago, I mentioned something about the icons, and I want to continue on that theme, because that's what is a reminder in coming into this building, and we are blessed to have a building with all these icons, with the structure that we have, in a way to remind ourselves, but also to focus our minds on what matter in life. I mentioned something about icons being an invitation. Of the, those of you who are 
architecture, uh, architects or engineers know that when you draw lines in, an, in a picture, the lines should meet in the infinity. Icons don't care about how we drew things in our reality. They are an invitation to a different reality. So the lines in some of the icons around us, I don't want to break your necks, but there's an icon here that shows how the lines meet in you, the person who's looking at the icon. The other one that might be useful enough is the one for St. Matthew. So the two lines, they don't meet in that desk that he's sitting on. They don't meet in infinity, they meet in you. Even the footstep that he has also does the same thing. On the other side, for that banquet on the, on the right, the lines are coming to you. They're not coming to infinity. And that's an invitation that we have to be getting out of this world to the reality where the icons are. Now, along these lines, that heavenly reality is not something that's in the future. We think that we're pursuing the heavenly kingdom as if it's in the future. It is present now. We just need to recognize it and live it where the true light of the world, which is Christ, is the one who takes care of everything. Now, in any building you go into, there's an iconostas. This is the official word for the icon screen that we have. Stasis is a Greek word which is the origin of static, but stand as well. So which means that this is, this is the icon stand that we have. This is not meant for separation between people and clergy. This is bringing our family in front of us to remind us of the unity that we are in. It is Christ, our Savior and our Creator, His Mother, the patron saints of the community, and the forerunner, who John the Baptist, who brought this message for, to the forefront for the people before Christ. So these icons on an icon stand are not for separation and to decorate a wall that separates people from clergy, but actually to remind us of who our family is and to bring us all together uh, in worship. Now, the middle door is what is known as the royal door or the beautiful gates. This is not just a door. And let me be blunt, this is not the door where you come up to search for the priest, okay? To sneak in and like, is father there or is there anyone? This is not just a door. This is a royal door where only Christ stands there. And everyone who stands there, is commission, he is commissioned by Christ himself. So it's only for the bishop, it's only for the priest and the deacon when they're doing something. If we're not doing anything in front of the altar, we should not be standing there. We should not be crossing from one side to the other. So that's why these are the royal doors. Now, I'm not going to close the doors now, but I want you to know that on our doors, we have the four evangelists. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which through their ministry and through their witness, the door of the Holy of Holies is open. Through their ministry, we can get into Christ who is going to be sacrificed on the altar table. Now, you notice on the table, on the lower part of the table, there's the Annunciation icon. Usually, this icon is on the door itself. So, in our case, because we have four leaves of the doors, we have the four uh, evangelists. It happens in other churches as well. But usually those doors are the Annunciation icon. When the Archangel Gabriel came to the Theotokos to announce the birth of Christ. Because that's the door where we get into Christ. That's the reason why the Annunciation icon is there. A reminder that if it was not for the Theotokos and for her willing to serve and to take Christ into her belly, we will not have the salvation altogether. Now, the same evangelists on the door, we have them on the four corners. For the same reason, it's through the evangelists that heaven is open to us. Through them, heaven is open to us. So in heaven, Christ is looking down to us. In the dome, it's always Christ. 
And I want to highlight this because you have been into so many churches around the world probably. You know in Western architecture, you go to an, a magnificent church, it's so high, it is very dizzying. You look up, you cannot even know where the, where the ceiling is of the church. In Orthodox churches, domes are essential. However big the church is, the dome is always there for a very simple reason. The dome itself gives the sense of condescension that God is there for us, but also He is embracing us. He is looking down, but He wants to embrace all of us. So domes are about the condescension of the divinity of Christ so, so that He will bring the entire humanity into His bosom. So with all these, again, on the dome, in our dome, you might go to other churches and they have something else. But in our dome and in most of the Orthodox churches, you'll see the, arch the angels are going around. And this is the divine liturgy, the heavenly divine liturgy that is done in heaven, which we replicate here. So that's heaven. And we are invited into heaven by being present here. We are reminded with the witnesses who came before us so that we also witness to Christ in the same manner. When we come into the church, we have to take that seriously. This is heaven now. That's why the beginning of the liturgy starts with, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit. It's an announcement that we are now in heaven. And so if we take this seriously, then we will become the light of the world. We have to take that seriously so we can take from the light of Christ and reflect it to the entire world outside. I hope that we take this invitation today not like a badge of honor for us, but take the responsibility that is reflected in everything we do in church so that we can truly be the light of the world. Amen.